Okay. Thank you guys for coming down today. Um, we're here at Defender Future to talk about the clean car standards and the proposed rollback that our administration has in mind for Americans. And so um, to get us started today, we're going to have Ding Sheng Li, the professor of public health at UNR, tell us why um, rolling back clean car standards may not be in the best interest of public health. All right, thank you, Baker, and uh, thank you everyone for coming here. So as Baker introduced, my name is Ding Shun Li. I'm from UNR. I'm an assistant professor of environmental health at the School of Computer Health Science. And basically today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the negative health impacts of the exhaust from gasoline-powered cars and why this matters to us that we need to have more efficient vehicles. Uh, so to get started, there are a few major pollutants coming from our cars running on gasoline. The first one and the biggest one is called the PM2.5. Uh, the full name of that is Particular Matter 2.5 and the 2.5 stands for a uh, diameter of 2.5 micrometers and it's hard to imagine but if, but if you like put a strand out of it here and divide it by 20 times that's about as small as it gets or you can imagine you go onto to Tahoe Beach and you pick up a fine sand and 100 times smaller will be a PM2.5 so they're basically very very small particulate matters that are floating around the air after they get out of the vehicle and they matter because uh, it is the most recent estimate around the globe that every year there is about 8.9 million premature death caused because of these PM2.5 particulate matters and they are these invisible killers that are floating around the air and after we inhale it because they are so small that they no lo uh, that they not also uh, not only excuse me uh, not only irritate our lungs but they can also penetrate the lung goes into our blood vessels and kind of like clog up our blood vessel and give you cardiovascular disease or strokes so those are the health impacts of pm 2.5 uh, that's a big one uh, the second one will be something that scientists call nox which is basically nitrogen oxides there are multiple chemicals in this group so they are referred as nox the uh, nox and these uh, pollutants they can form a uh, secondary pm 2.5 so what what happens is there is that they kind of come the core and then attract other chemicals and under some complex you know uh, uh, reactions uh, in the chemistry they become these particular matters as well uh, uh, determine uh, de uh, uh, harming our health and they themselves can also be forming what we call uh, uh, the ozone uh, which is another pollutant that can uh, give our respiratory system diseases and the NOx themselves can also uh, decrease our resistance to infectious diseases like uh, new, uh, like pneumonia and flu uh, the a third one is the VOCs uh, this is short for volatile organic chemicals and it's actually the VOCs and the NOx they will react on the sunlight to form the ozones which Los Angeles was notoriously well known about in the 70s and 80s and still being trouble right now and also individual VOCs uh, they include like something called benzene this is the primary uh, actually benzene now the primary exposure uh, for the public is from gasoline and if you look at the studies uh, workers working at gas stations before they have a much higher rate of getting leukemia uh, the cancer in your blood from being exposed to benzene so all these VOCs emitting from the cars uh, as a result of burning fossil fuel is uh, is kind of bad for our health and uh, and also there's a uh, the CO the carbon monoxide and I bet you all heard about like uh, during the winter times there may be a family that was uh, that was left the engine running and the exhaustion pipe was like uh, clogged by the snow wall or something like that and then their uh, daughter or son actually uh, tragically died in the car because of this uh, carbon monoxide suffocation so carbon monoxide actually uh, strips away our blood's ability to carry oxygen so that will like a uh, kind of like a uh, if it's essentially like suffocating people and although those cases are a bit more extreme we're still like getting more CO's of uh, the carbon monoxide into the air because of we're uh, having like lower fuel standards and driving gasoline powered cars and the final one is very well known is the CO2 the carbon monoxide so carbon monoxide is uh, is a greenhouse gas uh, a greenhouse gas and is the primary responsible for the current climate change that we're seeing and gasoline cars as 
any other fossil fuel burning processes, they will give up CO2s and into the air. And climate change, we are actually seeing it right now in the United States. Uh, as in, uh, I bet all of you have heard of the news of the hurricanes over there, but uh, so hurricanes, their intensity and frequency are happening, they increase as climate change become worse. And although in Reno, hurricanes may be a little bit too far yet, uh, we are seeing the wildfires being more and more frequent and more and more intense over the years. For example, in this August, uh, all the Reno locals cannot see the Sierra Mountains even from like we being like half an hour drive away from there because of the smoke that the wildfire is giving is so bad. And actually I have a personal incident that when I was going to CVS to get some Medicaid uh, medicines for my daughter, another gentleman walked into the store and was buying a respiratory mask because he feels he cannot breathe on the street. So climate change not only increases the hurricanes, but also increases these wildfires, wildfires that we are experiencing now every year over multiple weeks during the summer times. And that is very bad for our health. So that's kind of like the pollutants from uh, from cars and their negative health impacts. Uh, and what I want to say is that by relaxing the standards of the uh, of the uh, of the fuel efficiency, we are basically directly uh, directly increasing the proportional uh, proportionally the emission of these harmful pollutants into the air and harming the public health. A uh, 30 mpg and the 31 mpg may seem so small by just one mpg, but that is. But if you multiply that three percent over the 300 million people in the United States, you will result in thousands of diseases every year, and that is pretty bad in my opinion. And that is why I wish that uh, this nation can really like go back to on the track it was going like aiming for better fuel efficiency because that is like good for our health, and that is something everybody wants. Whether, whether or whether, no matter your political standings are, we want to live a healthier life. Yeah, so that's for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ding Cheng. I think that all of us could agree that if we could create um, a better quality of life and save money doing so, that that makes sense. And I think that's why we're here today is because we all value uh, maintaining a higher quality of life for our citizens and creating um, efficiencies that create more money in the pockets of Americans, especially here in Nevada. So next up, we have Tom Poliklis from the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project. Um, he's our Nevada representative, and I'm excited to hear what you have to say, Tom. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking today. My name is Tom Polakalis. I'm the Nevada representative of the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project. We're a nonprofit public interest organization that serves six states in the southwestern United States. I'm also proud to be a Reno native and uh, third generation Nevadan. I also undertook graduate studies in economics at the University of Nevada, Reno. And the proposed rollback of federal fuel efficiency standards for cars is a direct economic threat to Nevada's families and to our state. When we waste gas in inefficient cars, we're burning money. Nevada's families can't afford to do that, particularly those of modest means. And the fuel efficiency standards have been working well to date. Thus far, it's uh, estimated that uh, the fuel efficiency standards have saved Nevadans over $290 million. Now this is a significant amount of money that has been kept in our local economy through these standards, rather than being spent, sent and spent outside the state of Nevada. Now when we save money uh, through greater efficiency on uh, higher efficiency cars, we create an, uh, an economic stimulus. When we save the money on gasoline with more efficient cars, that those savings can be spent in the local economy. So that $290 million is multiplied by at least double, creating a fairly substantial economic stimulus to the state of Nevada. There are various factors uh, job multipliers, spending multipliers that give us that uh, more than double bang for our buck. Through the federal corporate average fuel efficiency standard, we save money through better, more efficient technologies. We avoid the draining of money outside Nevada, reducing Nevadan spending power. So let's not be foolish. Let's not go down the counterproductive road that damages Nevada's and the nation's economy. Now, when we put that into an individual family's uh, pocketbook, it's estimated that the standards, if kept in place over the next 10 years, would save each Nevada family about $3,000. That's a significant amount of money, even over a 10-year period. 
And that's at today's current price of gasoline. There's a very frightening possibility, very realistic, that the price of oil, petroleum, gasoline could go up much higher due to instability in the Middle East and other factors. And what happens to Nevadans and other Americans if the price of gas goes up 50% or more? And I'm old enough to remember the gas lines that the first oil embargo brought to this area when I was a uh, senior at Reno High School. We had to be in gas lines back in the late 70s. And that was back um, a number of years ago. Again, the price of gasoline was much, much lower than it is today. And closer to today it was as recent as 2014 when the price of a gallon of gas was above $4 a gallon. By maintaining fuel efficiency standards, we reduce the risk of high gasoline prices. We also work for greater energy independence and improve our national security. Also on the economic front, there are significant economic costs to the health consequences of pollution caused by the inefficient use of energy. It's been noted that currently in uh, Nevada today, over 220,000 children and adults suffer from asthma in, in our state. And in Washoe County, we're looking at 28,000 adults that are suffering from asthma. These are health costs that greater efficiency can help ameliorate. So what do we do? Uh, this is still in play. We can still contact our elected representatives in Congress, our senators and our U.S. congressmen. We can also make comments during the public comment period. So for the economic benefits of these standards, for the health benefits that have been uh, alluded to in detail, Let's contact our representatives and say we want to maintain the path of greater fuel efficiency. It's good for our health, our economy, and our national security. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate you coming out and speaking on this today. Our greatest capacity is um, standing up for what we believe in. And here in Nevada, it was shocking to me to find out from our representatives that the most calls that they get on a given day, um, whether it's uh, Senator Heller or Catherine Cortez Masto's office or even um, Congressman Amade, is from wild horse advocates. And I think that that says a lot about what a capacity we have to stand up and to call our representatives and to express to them what's important to us um, like public health and maintaining cleaner car standards for our citizens. So Sarah Peters um, was not able to join us this morning. She did say that um, she's open to being contacted and she always has a lot of powerful commentary to put in there. And as an environmental scientist, definitely somebody who I look to for um, powerful information around these issues. So I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning of this. My name is Rebecca Stetson. Um, in my home life, I'm a mother to three children. And in my past life, I had an organic farm and also was a corporate banker. So economies of things matter to me. And um, I also have a huge passion around public health. And today, um, Although I do some work for the National Wildlife Federation around climate change, today I'm here representing Moms Clean Air Force. Moms Clean Air Force, excuse me, and we're I'm part of a force of over a million moms and dads across the country who st are standing up for our children's health through clean air, and. First and foremost, um, the rollback of clean car standards is a threat to our very existence. It's short-sighted and it's greedy policy that removes the market's ability to set a standard that will promote less pollution to our air. Climate change is a reality and a large chunk of our warming environment is carbon emissions from vehicles. And whether we're aware of it or not, um, Reno is one of the fastest warming cities in the nation. And I think it's important to start off with that because many of our citizens still are not aware of that fact, although we feel it. Um, and if you've lived here for any amount of time, you definitely felt it this summer. Um, so what would the clean car standards being rolled back do for Nevadans? So first and foremost, it means bigger gas bills for Nevadans. A new analysis by MJ Bradley and Associates shows that this proposal would cost Americans in every state. The proposed rollback um, would cost an average family $200 more per year and as much as $500 more per year if gas prices continue to rise. Um, because clean car standards reduce pollution and spur fuel efficiency gains, they're a win-win. Cleaner air, lower gas mills. Families who buy more efficient vehicles will start saving money immediately, and those savings will continue on for the life of their vehicle. Um, these standards being rolled back would mean more pollution. And as uh, Dr. Lee said earlier, um, here in Nevada, especially in the winter, we have inversions, 
uh, inversions that come into the valley that cause a lot of public health issues for all of our people, but especially the elderly and our young. And um, the American Lung Association and 12 other public health organizations have spoken out against this, de detailing the importance of maintaining protective clean car standards for public health. Um, American jobs and innovation are at risk. Here, uh, right outside Arena, we now have the world's largest industrial park that is home to Tesla, um, a groundbreaking revolutionary manufacturer of electric vehicles. And this legislation being rolled back um, directly targets what innovation is. The past few years have brought lower polluting, more efficient cars and trucks to the market with record sales. And the um, UAW President Dennis Williams recently stated that he did not support the administrative efforts to roll back these standards um, because he's quoted, we had an agreement and I don't think that we ought to be rolling back the standards. I think we ought to use some common sense. Um, the auto manufacturer Ford said that we support increasing clean car standards through 2025 and are not asking for a rollback. Other countries like China, the world's largest new vehicle market, are pushing toward a zero emissions future and U.S. automakers can't afford to fall behind. The other and um, the last point I have is that state leadership is under attack. These proposed rollbacks take a stab at the state authority to make standards for their own states that are more stringent than the federal mandates. After the terrible pollution that California endured in the 70s and 80s, it, cre they, it created the Clean Air Act, which gave California the authority to set its own vehicle pollution standards and allowed other states to take suit in the same way and also the courage to do so. Because the clean car standards reduce pollution and fuel efficiency gains, they're a win-win with cleaner air and lower gas bills. Um, we have a voice together that's loud and clear, and we want cleaner air, a reduction in global warming, and a fair chance at health and wellness for all. And it's important for us to take that message back to our policymakers so that, as opposed to wild horse advocates being the greatest amount of calls they get each day, that they're hearing from constituents about climate change. Um, my grandfather is uh, 84 and during the summer he was unable to take his daily walks that he enjoys so much and that can, creates a, um, a sense of purpose and a value within his community when he gets to see his neighbors because the air quality was too poor. And although some people may say, well, what do wildfires have to do with clean car standards? As was mentioned earlier, sorry about that. Um, Climate change is largely caused by emissions from vehicles. And as we see our climate warming, we're seeing increased mega fires as a result of climate change. And so if we value our quality of life, um, it's time for us to stand up and make those phone calls and demand um, a cleaner future for ourselves and for our children. Thank you guys for coming out today. Uh, I appreciate everybody who showed up. And if you guys need any more public comment, our reporters, uh, we are here and available for you. And Din Cheng, I'm super excited to work with you in the future. Tom, I know we'll be working together. And thank you, Marguerite. And I'm sorry, I totally forgot your name. Charlie for coming out and setting up the stand. Jennifer Ann for doing the video. And for our volunteer back here, thank you for coming. It takes a whole community and um, Although oftentimes it feels like we're silos, there are a lot of people and we just need to get together more often and make a bigger wave. Thank you guys.